Benjamin, who's an award-winning mental health campaigner, producer, and public speaker, and he's the founder of the mental health charity Beyond, which supports young people in the UK. And we're also joined by his father, Michael Benjamin, um, who is also a trustee of Beyond. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Yep. So before we dive fully in, um, I wanted to share something with you all that Johnny and Michael and I discuss as we've been preparing for, for this webinar and conversation. Um, this is called learning to talk about mental health. And so we would really encourage you to be as active as you want to be over the Q&A. It is really, really difficult to speak about mental health, whether it's with your colleagues, your friends, your partners, your family, you know, and often people don't say anything because they're worried about saying the right thing or asking things in the right way. So tonight we want to create the space for you to ask whatever you want. Um, we all understand that this is a difficult topic to talk about, that it, you know, it gets very emotional, that people get very worried about it. Um, but we really want to sort of break those stigmas and encourage people to talk as much as possible. So please ask any questions that you have and don't worry about writing it all in the perfect way. Um, we know what you might mean um, and we'll make sure we kind of tackle as many questions um, that you ask. And we want to make sure that this is deep and as personal conversation as we can have over Zoom. Um, so we'll try, we'll try our best with that. Um, so um, without further ado, Johnny, maybe I can just hand over to you for you to tell us a bit more about your life and journey, which is truly inspirational. But, uh, firstly, thank you very much to yourself and The Conduit for, for having us. Um, yeah, obviously really, really, really important subject. Um, so for me, uh, uh, well, I, uh, my, my um, by the way, is it, is it focused on, is it all right? The, it's or, perfect. Fine, I'm, I, okay, don't need to worry about it. Okay. You're looking great. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Um, so yeah, but what, essentially, I guess my, my own mental health issues started when I was really young. So, um, my dad, my dad and my mum actually took me to a, a psychologist when I was five. So, um, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd stop sleeping properly and I'd become very anxious and, um, I wasn't myself. Um, so from an early age, we, I don't know, we knew there was something there. Um, but it was never really like properly, properly addressed. So, you know, when I was growing up, mental health just was not talked about, you know, when I was at school, um, when I went to, to college, university, it was such a taboo. Um, and I think to add to that, we're, we're from a Jewish uh, community and I think, yeah, often in religious communities, there's even more stigma. So yeah, mental health, just, I just had no education or kind of understanding of it. Um, but I think for me, um, I really, really started struggling in my sort of mid teens um and I, I i didn't i just didn't understand what was going on but um i was i was suffering from really really low moods um i thought i was being spoken to by the devil i was being told to do certain things otherwise bad things would happen um i was delusional i believed at times there were cameras watching me um but i i just it was just, it was a, it was a source of um, shame and embarrassment. And, you know, on the outside as well, I was doing really well at, like, academically in school. I had really good prospects. And so I didn't, I, I, I hid everything from my, my dad and the rest of my family and my friends um, until the point of, of, of university. So essentially I, so we're from, we're from London, we're from North London. And um, I went away to Manchester to university thinking I could escape escape everything but um yeah at university that's when everything sort of came out and I had a, a, a breakdown of psychotic episodes whilst at university and I ended up in a, in a psychiatric hospital and and yeah as soon as I was admitted to the hospital then everyone knew and uh it was it was yeah incredibly difficult and we didn't know what to say to each other myself my dad my family we just didn't have the language um and i was really unwell and unfortunately i got worse uh in the hospital i was given this diagnosis of um schizoaffective disorder which is like a form of schizophrenia um and basically i spent a month in the in the psychiatric hospital before i actually ended up uh running away 
um and i went to a bridge um i just completely as soon as i got the diagnosis to be honest i gave up i just i just could not see a future um and yeah i ended up i ended up on 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 the edge of this bridge but for me fortunately i was talked off the edge by a stranger um who just his his presence and his words just yeah they changed things for me and i i think for me the kind of hope that he offered me i hadn't i i just didn't have any hope anymore um but he yeah he offered me words of, of hope and encouragement and that was a bit of a turning point um and i guess it was the very very start of a very long road to kind of recovery um or, or, or not uh, recoveries um or, or at least learning to tackle what, what was going on at least learning to try and manage what was going on but it took years to be honest um and it took years for m me to really open up to yeah my, my dad my family my friends um it was just so much kind of shame and um uh confusion and um Again, I think we just, we didn't have the language. No one, <laughs> no one gave us the sort of language to use, to talk about it, the confidence. Um, so it was, it was really hard and it's been a real, yeah, a real journey in terms of learning to, you know, learning to talk about it, learning to, uh, getting rid of this shame and the uh, embarrassment. That's taken a long time to, to get rid of all of that. Um, but things are, are different today. Um, so, you know, we do talk openly about about my mental health and we have to because you know i it's an ongoing um thing for me it's an it's not it's a there's no cure and um well for me there's no cure it's something i have to try and manage and i i have relapses and you know i end up back in 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 a psychiatric hospital um but yeah it is different now because i do i do talk and i i, I ask for help i think that's the biggest change is I ask for help when I need it, which has taken a long time. Um, but, um, and, my, and I guess my dad knows, uh, you know, when I'm not well, he knows what to do. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I feel, to be honest, I feel like, you know, very fortunate. We're, we're, we're in a fortunate position because um, we do know how to address it. But unfortunately we meet so many yeah people so many families that that don't know how to talk about it and address it and it's yeah it's really really tough so again really grateful that you know we've got this opportunity to to talk and to hopefully maybe help other people that you know might be struggling themselves or with their family members as well thank you johnny um i mean there's so much to your journey and it's it's been a pleasure kind of getting to know you and, and following your work these past months um You've written actually a book about your sort of road to recovery um, from sort of despair to hope. Um, and if anyone hasn't read it or would, would like to read it, I recommend everyone checks it out and we'll send a link after the event. Um, but obviously, um, The Stranger on the Bridge was a huge turning point for you. Um, and it triggered off a, a whole series of different sort of changing moments for you in your, your life and, and being able to talk about um, your mental health. Can you just tell us a little bit more about, you know, that day on the bridge, what that strange, who that stranger was, um, and how how you got to the point of of, of find Mike, um, which yeah. you can also tell us all about as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that was obviously a hugely significant moment on the on on the bridge, running away to the bridge, and then obviously being stopped. Um, and it, it uh, I mean, you know, looking back, so this was two thousand and um, January two thousand and eight. So literally just before my 21st birthday. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, what, what, what this stranger did, he's not a stranger anymore, I'll go on to, but, um, you know, he just, he had a real sort of human conversation connection with me. Um, you know, often people ask me what was his like secret formula to talk me off the edge, but you know, and he says himself, it wasn't, there's no secret. It's not rocket science. It's being really, really human. Cause in the hospital where I was, um, uh, it was tough. I was, I was on this, what they called the suicide ward. Um, 
where you know everything's taken away from you you're watched 24 7 um then they don't talk to you they just watch you they just observe you and you know if someone is paranoid and you know unwell and delusional it's just it's the worst and i just couldn't i just couldn't bear it anymore so yeah i, I ran away but you know when i met the stranger on the bridge we had this just yeah like human conversation. I hadn't had a human conversation in, in a month since I was admitted. Um, and yeah, I, he, he eventually told me off the edge, but um, we were going to go for a coffee, but um, the, the police, someone, someone called the police, police turned up and um, I was, I was taken away. I was sectioned. Um, and then turned back to the hospital that I ran away from but I felt I did feel different like I think you know I mentioned the word hope I had a bit of hope from talking talking to this this guy on the bridge and when I was in a in a in a better place so it was actually six years on from that day on the bridge um I decided to launch a search to find him um to, to obviously to, to thank him you know for, for what he did but also to raise awareness of of mental illness and particularly suicide um, I mean, ugh, suicide is, uh, so, I mean, you know, we're talking about mental health. I mean, suicide is an even more difficult taboo subject. It's, you know, we are, well, no, we've still got a long way to go, I think, to talk about it uh, openly. Um, so yeah, the, the purpose of this campaign was, was obviously to find this guy, but also to get people talking. I mean, the, the statistics, uh, when it comes to suicide are, are shocking. It's every 40 seconds around the world, someone unfortunately takes their own life. Um, and in terms of, uh, of men, it's one man every minute around the world. So it's just, I was, yeah. Um, the amazing thing was about the campaign. So I, I basically, I got his name wrong when I launched the campaign in my head, this guy's name was Mike. Um, you know, my memory of that day on the bridge was, was, was hazy, but yeah, I believe his name was Mike. And so I launched this search called Fine Mike and um, amazingly he came for he wasn't called Mike he's called Neil but um, you know he came forwards within it took two weeks and through the power of social media through Facebook actually uh, yeah he came forwards and um, we were reunited and that was a real extraordinary moment um, for me and you know for dad and my family it was huge 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 moment um, and yeah, we started working together and, um, you know, he was just, I don't know. So, uh, when he heard my story and the statistics that I mentioned, he was just so kind of, um, determined to get involved and yeah, we started working and campaigning together and, um, it's been, um, yeah, extraordinary journey to be honest since really has. What I was struck is um, there's also a Channel 4 documentary on uh, The Stranger on the Bridge and, and how Johnny uh, found Neil. Um, and what really struck me in, in listening to it as well was also how many people came forward that potentially could have been Neil. Um, yeah. And, you know, they all had true stories to tell of, you know, that period in time when they happened to be on Waterloo Bridge um, and where they actually had spoken someone down as well. Um, and so that coupled with the stats that you've just shared is just, you know, really, really sat with me and is, is truly shocking. Yeah. Um, I know obviously after this um, and sort of after you went, um, you were sectioned again and, and came out and were getting help, you started actually blogging to start talking about um, your mental health um, and your diagnosis and actually having that kind of space to start forming that language. Um, how how did you kind of start doing that because that's a, a huge effort to kind of put yourself out there as well to be kind of recording yourself speaking about it whilst also trying to start those conversations with your family how how did you go through that process well to be honest i mean i i initially started under a pseudonym i didn't want my family and my friends to know i was doing it but i was desperate to kind of communicate uh with people that you know i just knew i wasn't alone i felt alone with my diagnosis and my experiences but I knew I wasn't alone so I I didn't tell my family and friends I was doing it but I started to just you know I'd just record stuff on my phone and um and, and put it out and so I, I, I didn't mention but for me as well I, I really struggled with my sexuality 
And um, I mean, it, it, to be honest, it's all interlinked, you know, my, my, my mental health issues, my sexuality, um, you know, my religion. Um, so there was a lot going on and I just needed to, yeah, communicate some of that. So I started vlogging and, um, and then it, it kind of, uh, yeah, people started to find out my family and my friends and do you know what it was, it was, it was helpful because um, it allowed us to start having difficult conversations, but it finally allowed us to start talking. Um, but um, I just always struggled with kind of, I always struggled with traditional forms of, you know, I'd seen a lot of different psychiatrists and therapists, and I always struggled with the face-to-face, -face, you know, interaction, just, you know, pouring out everything to a stranger. Well, um, in, in that sort of, clinical setting i'd always struggled with it but there was something um recording the vlogs on the phone i, I don't know i could oh, i could speak more easily you know um so it was really interesting and i'm always saying to people you know look for different outlets because that i just think for a lot of people that traditional form of you know clinical therapy it's it's, it's really it's really hard we know the dropout rate in the mental health services are huge people find it really hard to you know, be with someone face to face and pour everything out. So yeah, um, has to be another way. And I will hundred percent come back to that later because you were just recently giving me some advice about that with some, one of my friends, but, um, just in terms of sort of starting that conversation and, and Michael, I'd love your, your thoughts on this too, is just, you know, you mentioned you just didn't have the language to even kind of speak with each other about um, your diagnosis, what happened, what happened to you growing up. And, you know, as you say, the mix between your sort of mental health, your sexuality, your religion. How did you, once you started having those conversations, how did you guys start talking? Because I can imagine it was sort of stop, start, very uncomfortable, very emotional, and, you know, has probably taken a long time for you guys to get to where you are now, which is doing events together and speaking so openly. Um, you know, maybe Michael, I'll, I'll come to you as, as, as Johnny's father as well and, and watching your child go through that. Um, yeah, if I, if I, 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 I just take you back as well from um, when Johnny was growing up, um, as you said, we took him to a doctor, but it was one of those things where, you know, oh, he's five, six, he's going to grow out of this and whatever. And sort of nothing else happened after that because, um, and um at school, we never had any issues at all. He was always, uh, we never had an issue where he said he didn't want to go to school and his reports were always fantastic. So there was never any issues there. It was only when he went to university, we, we did see a change. Um, and we went up to university, he was studying um, um, drama and he was in a really heavy play. Um, and we went up just before Christmas and uh, he didn't look well, lost a lot of weight, and um, so well, you know, been partying is you know usual university. Um, and when he got home, literally locked himself in his room for three, four days, and we knew it wasn't wasn't right. So we took him to a local doctor, and I think she was with him for fifteen minutes, and just said um, he needs to go into hospital, into psych. Catholic Hospital, and there's one in Harrow, which is not far from where we live. And we took him in there. And don't forget, we're going back now, 12 years now, and no one ever talked about mental health. No one knew a thing at all about mental health. Um, and literally, when we took him in there, we were told he was suicidal, took everything away. And all we were told was these are the visiting hours, and that was it. There was no help for us at all. Thank goodness things have moved on. There is help for people now. And I think they've now realized that family need help as well, because how do you deal with things like this? And, you know, when you phone somebody to say your son's in hospital, um, the automatic thing they say is that he had an accident. Um, when we did try and explain, it was very, very difficult. The amazing thing was, is that we actually spoke to somebody who we knew for many years, and they actually came out and said, oh, their son suffers from anxiety and uh, but we never knew. And they did it because they didn't know how to talk about it either. Um, so it took a long time. Um, the other thing was that, uh, as I said, you know, this 
the doctor in, in the hospital, it was, uh, we used to be in the office with him and it was over a desk. It was never face to face as such. And it was a clipboard, basically he had a clipboard in his hand and it was answering these questions and he kept on looking above his head uh, beyond us. And when we stood up, we realized there was a clock there and it was a time limit of how long he would spend with us. So we, we had absolutely no hope, no, no help at all. Um, but what happened was, you, everybody's got lots of acquaintances, but we, you've got a few what you call really close friends that you can be quite honest with. And we spoke to them and they were very sympathetic. Um, they didn't know how to, how to ask us, or, but they were sympathetic. And again, it's sort of, well, you know, here would get better. They had no idea, but they'd get better. Um, and obviously I had the phone call. I was in a meeting in London. I had a phone call to say Johnny had run away and it was in January. Uh, it's a freezing cold day and I rushed to um, hospital and he was in um, uh, accident emergency and again he was left in a room by himself with nobody there to talk to um, so really the help that was available from anyone that was was non-existent uh, for, for both of us um, but it took uh, quite a few years before we could talk about anything, even when Johnny came out and then he started to go to work. And when he launched the campaign, I think we were all shocked at, the, um, uh, at, at, at what happened in this campaign. Um, and it actually really started people talking, but we still did not really have that conversation. I think what happened was, there was a couple of things really that, that happened was, um, I was diagnosed with, with prostate cancer and, uh, over you now over five years ago. Um, and what happens is the, the hospital will tell you, oh, this is going to happen. This is, this is the treatment and, and everything else. Thank goodness everything was fine now. Um, but what happened was it enabled us to actually start talking about my illness. And we thought, well, if we can talk about physical illness, then we should also be able to talk about mental illness. And the other thing that we found was it was very difficult talking face to face. So we used to do what we call drive time. <laughs> so you talk when you're sitting next to each other and it's, it's a gradual process, you know, it's, it's not, uh, uh, you know, and the other thing is as well is that um, you're frightened to ask a question because you think uh, it's not right, but actually you should ask the question. You should ask if, how do you feel today? Um, and you should also listen to the answer. Um, because uh, if you don't ask the question, then you really don't know what's, uh, what's going on. Um, and as Johnny says, when he's not well, you know, I, I know the difference when he says, I don't feel well, so don't feel well because I've got upset stomach or cold to when he's, he's having, uh, you know, um, a relapse. And that mainly is because he's, he doesn't get his sleep or whatever. But the other thing is as well now, he's a psychiatrist and, she's fantastic we know she's always late because she spends time but she also speaks to the family as well um but also um when johnny was in hospital uh, a couple of years ago now we, we we were literally going in to see him and as she came out she said it'll be okay it'll be fine um he needs to sleep and it'll be fine and it gives you hope you know and that's what you need um you know you you learn um how to cope with it and um Unfortunately, you hear too many stories now, um, but I think with parents, um, siblings, and whatever, you know, Johnny said that you know he has he feels you, know, you get shame, and for the parents, you feel guilty because why did you not know? Um, but now there's a lot of help out there. I, I think you know, uh, you know, charities and Samaritans, etc. They have help for um, parents, siblings as well for someone to talk to because there's no doubt about it you need to talk and the worst is is men because men don't talk about things you know so um it, it's a gradual process it's it's not a, a, a quick answer and johnny how did how how have you found that i mean i guess it also expanding out beyond your family to sort of just discussing it with your friends and and, and sharing your di diagnosis 
Um, is that something, how have you kind of built that up over time? Because I know when you and I were chatting a little bit as well, when you sort of explain schizoaffective disorder and what it is and, you know, that it's um, a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar, people are also quite, um, kind of not necessarily shocked, but are taken aback because they don't actually really know what those terms actually really mean. Um, and, you know, they just sort of think of the worst or think about whatever, you know, the media has portrayed them to be versus understanding what it actually means for the person um, who has that disorder. So, you know, how have you coped with sort of chatting with your family, but also your friends about, about this and, and getting to the point where you are now, which is obviously speaking to all of us and we'll get on to what you're doing with your charity beyond, but, you know, really being this champion for, you know, let's talk and, and let's really start talking to children about their mental health and, and creating this language and, and discourse to be possible. Yeah, I found it. I mean, again, I just, I just couldn't be honest with my friends, to be honest. Yeah, to, to be frank, uh, for, for a long time. I didn't want to tell them I had this diagnosis, for sure, um, because I was, I was worried about their reaction. Um, I, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't need to be. You know, I built up such fear in my head about how people would respond when I told them I had this diagnosis. And yeah, I, yeah. Um, but... Again, it's, it's, it's been a journey for everyone, for my family, for my friends as well, in terms of um, talking about it. Again, you know, coming from, so I went to a Jewish school. I've got a lot of uh, school friends that, again, you know, because we didn't learn anything about mental health. So actually, the only thing that we got in school about mental health was watching the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That was it. That was all we were given. And that film is just, uh, it's not the most inspiring film you know, about mental health. But that's all we all we got given at school. And so for my, particularly my school friends, um, it's been, a, again, a real tough journey um, talking to them, opening up to them. Um, yeah, I, they, they didn't know how to, how to respond, how to talk to me when I was unwell, when I was going through relapses. Um, again, it's, it's different now. It's different now. Um, I think I've learned over the years who, you know, when I'm, when I'm struggling, when I'm not well, who I'm best placed to kind of talk to. Um, some people still find the conversation really tricky. You know, uh, I was with a group, a group of friends uh, a few years ago and I was having a relapse at the time. And I, I just, I, I, I said to them all, we were, we were in a restaurant and I said to them all, look, I just want to be honest and say that I'm struggling. I'm having a relapse. You know, I'm, back on my medication and it just went it, there was this horrible silence and someone was just like let's get the bill and uh i don't know i was just like oh if, you know um I, I just think often uh it's not that people don't care i you know i know that my friends they all they, they really do care but they just find it uncomfortable you know again like dad said if it's a physical health issue um you know, much more happier to, to talk about it. You know, my friends, you know, they'll talk about, you know, bad backs or, you know, bad colds and no shame, no shame at all. But still, when it comes to mental health, there is still this, um, yeah, shame and stigma. But, you know, when I go, so I go back to my old school now to give talks to young people. And um, what's really positive is that I, I see a real change. You know, young people, when I go back to, my old school when I go to other schools young people and I'm generalizing but young people are more open I, I, I'm generalizing but yeah they are more open about mental health about sexuality which is amazing um and actually I guess we'll come on to it but on on a, as part of our charity we've got a youth board and these are all young people in their teens and their 20s who are just so open and articulate about their their, their mental health and it's really I feel like the future's bright because the next generation um they are they are less afraid to to kind of talk about this this subject so yeah i feel i feel there's still a way to go in terms of like um you know my generation older generations particularly it's still still a way to go it's still a big taboo but definitely the younger the next generation i i feel yeah i just feel much more positive about thank you we're already starting to get quite a few questions so i'm gonna actually divert over to those and, and kind of weave them in. Um, Philippa asks, um, she's interested to hear more about your experience with therapy. Um, I mean, I would sort of broaden that question out as well to sort of say, how are you managing your sort of mental well-being 
um, today. I know you've, you know, you've seen quite a few different people um, and that in itself is, I think, a, a huge challenge for people. Um, you know, they don't necessarily click with the first person they're supposed to be seeing or the first person they're seeing, you know, is, as your dad mentioned, kind of watching the clock and waiting for the session to finish. So, um, yeah, I would, I would love to just build on that and sort of say, what has your experience been with therapy? How, how has it been useful to you? Um, how has that sort of evolved over time? Um, and what else have you done to sort of, you know, manage your own well-being? Yeah, it's, uh, therapy, um, it's been a real mixed bag. Um, and I think, you know, I talked, obviously talked to a lot of people who've also been on similar journeys. And again, the, the, the mental health services, uh, yeah, real, it can be a real, it can be a real mixed bag. Um, for me, I mean, I've had different types of therapy. Um, predominantly CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, you know, really focused on looking at your thoughts, really delving deep into your thoughts. Um, and if, uh, do you know what, it, for me, it depends on the therapist, to be honest, and the therapist or the psychiatrist, or it depends on the relate. It's, it's all about the relationship uh, for me, you know, um, I, I've, I've, I think I've struggled um and and you know dad mentioned the current psychiatrist that i see i just i just feel comfortable talking to her because um at the most a lot of the people that i've seen in the past it's been so clinical and it's so kind of um you know you've got six you're given six sessions if you you know if you go via the nhs or 12 sessions and you've got to be out within those six or 12 sessions and there's a real pressure you know and i don't know it's just so kind of really clinical and, and dad mentioned the clipboard as well i mean i just it's, what so what i the times that i've benefited the most from like therapy is is when you know there's been a real strong solid relationship with the person i'm sitting you know with um yeah but it's definitely been a been a been a mixed been a mixed bag for sure yeah sorry i can't remember there was another part of that question i think i can't remember what it was I guess it's just how do you find the person who you do feel oh, comfortable speaking to without kind of giving up that it's just not going to going to work. Yeah, yeah. I, I always say to people, you know, do keep keep going because it is. It's so frustrating when you you know because you you go and you pour your whole history, mental health history out, and then maybe you realise this relationship isn't right. It's not going to work, and you have to find someone else. It's, it's really frustrating. But you know, I always say to people, you know, don't give up. We as dad said, we've now got a really great psychiatrist and it's taken a while to get there, but it's worth it. Um, I think for me as well, I think things like, you know, peer support um, have been really helpful. You know, I've been to uh, kind of group sort of therapy uh, quite a few times in the past. Um, you know, organizations like Re Rethink Mental Illness, um, I've been to a lot of their support groups and they have support groups for families, for parents as well. And um, I found that really useful um because i just realized that i'm not alone like you know i sit in the in this group and um yeah other people are saying things that are in my head and i'm just like wow like i'm i'm oh, yeah i'm definitely not alone with this and that is a big relief so so group therapy or group kind of work has been really useful um i think for me it's, it's been about sort of building up a toolbox um so you know for me things like yoga mindfulness are really helpful it doesn't, but they don't work for, for everyone. But, you know, um, again, people will sometimes say to me, I've tried everything. And, you know, I always think there's something for everyone. I really do. Um, I'm a big believer in, in, you know, things like art therapy, the creative sort of therapies. And again, our, our charity has funded different kind of art therapy projects because, you know, as I said before, sometimes a lot of the time, the traditional face-to-face -face therapy is just doesn't work for everyone. So we need to look at, you know, uh, other alternatives. And I will just finally say that I think during lockdown, it's been interesting. Um, obviously, it's been tough, you know, the isolation has been tough, particularly people that struggle with their mental health, but there's been so much online and do have a look at what, you know, different charities are offering online in terms of things like online yoga, online meditation. Uh, that's definitely kept me going. I think during the last few months is because I live alone and it's tough, but, you know, doing things online, um yeah there's a lot out there which is great michael yeah if i go back uh really 
Donnie was saying, um, and that's why I was saying about physical health, mental health, there's no different. It's like, you know, when you when you have to go, you've got something wrong with your leg or, or anything else, or you've got problems with your teeth, you know, you find the dentist and you don't always find the right dentist to start with. You don't always find the right doctor. Um, and the case is a case of talking to people. And also there is great online help now. Um, we'll talk about you know, there's one um, website that's called Hub of Hope we'll talk about, um, which you can go on and, and just put your area in and different services come up. Um, but it's a case of finding, you know, someone that you're comfortable with, uh, you know, whether it's mental health or say you've got a problem with your teeth, you know, you go to one dentist and you don't have any faith in them. Um, so you find somewhere else and, and it, it does take time. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's, it is a case. Um, and also, um, as Johnny quite right said, you know, there's help there for families. I mean, I've done something locally. Um, <laughs> it's only just started, uh, but we started a father's forum where, um, you know, they've all got unfortunate children that have suffered. Uh, eating disorders that, that's the thing with with, uh, with with mental health you know it's not just one thing you know there's lots of different things as well so you've got to find the right person that can uh, maybe there's someone that's better on on eating disorders and and, and and other areas as well but all the fathers have uh, have children that uh, from different ages that suffer and it's a forum that people can get together and and talk uh, but quite openly um, and sometimes you can give them a lead, you can signpost them, sometimes you can't, but I think they, they find it's, it's a, a relief that they can actually talk to somebody and be open uh, about it without anybody making any judgments, if, if you like. So, you know, just keep on always saying there's a need, you, you do need to talk and it's, it's not easy. The first conversation is always very hard um but it, it does get easier um it's, it's 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 not an easy subject to talk about but you know if you go back 10 12 years ago no one talked about cancer you know it was always you know mentioned the c word because no one would actually say the word now um people come out and oh yes and and um so i think uh mental health is getting that way uh the stigma is still stigma there but it's it, it there's less stigma than there used to be because I think also it helps in in some ways where you get well-known people coming out and saying that they're suffering um, I think also you know apart from young people there's a big issue of of the workplace um, okay now the lockdown but before the lockdown people were working ridiculous hours um, going to the office and obviously it affects, so I think big companies are now taking it on board as well and doing a lot more as far as mental health. I mean, let's face it, probably three years ago, four years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. Uh, you, you know, uh, Conjit, uh, whatever, I've got to be praised for, for, for doing it. Um, so it's moved on because, uh, as I say, a few years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here now uh, having a conversation about mental health. So it has moved on. And Johnny, I mean, one of our members has asked, where does the shame stem from? I think we've all felt this too. Um, why? Um, do you have any words that could kind of help us frame why, why we think there's shame um, connected with your sort of mental well-being, whatever that might be? Well, I definitely think uh, the media um, have, have a lot to answer for. So, you know, it's really interesting when I look back over history, um, so there were lots of, uh, you know, famous people, lots of philosophers that maybe heard voices and they were kind of held up for hearing voices. They weren't considered mad or crazy. And if you look at, you know, um, for example, shamanism, uh, you know, if, if again, if you hear a voice and you're part of that tribe, you're kind of revered, you know what I mean? But so it's, um, I, I think, yeah, I think things like media, the, the portrayals of mental illness, um, yeah, again, going back to things like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I mean, it's really not great. Um, it, people are, it's made people scared. It's made people scared. And particularly, you know, um, issues such as um, schizophrenia. I mean, if you just, even today, if you look in the media, if you type into like the Google news search, schizophrenia, 
what comes up time and time again is um, it's related to people that are, are violent and dangerous. And so there's still this sort of, which really annoys me because it's such a tiny percentage, tiny, tiny percentage of people with schizophrenia are, are violent and dangerous, you know? And yet that's what the media still tend to report, I guess, because it sells newspapers and stuff, but it's really frustrating. Um, I mean, again, I, th I think, well, I don't know. I, sometimes I think we're moving forwards and sometimes I see front pages of newspapers and I think we, we're not moving forwards. I mean, to be honest, um, if you look at, you know, earlier this year, the, the really tragic um, suicide of, of Caroline Flack, uh, the way the media, you know, treated her, she was obviously very vulnerable. And uh, it's happened time and time again, you know, Amy Winehouse, um, Whitney Houston. I mean, it's just it's endless, endless. The way that the media portray people that might struggle with, with addiction or, or mental health. I just think it's, um, and that, I think, yeah, brings, up, brings a lot of shame for everyone and stigma if you're, if you're suffering. So I think we still have a way to go, a long way to go, actually. Um, till, again, Dad, Dad mentioned things like cancer. You know, there's so many you know, films or, or programs that show people overcoming things like cancer. But if you look at something like, yeah, schizophrenia, I mean, where, where can you watch a TV program or see a film where someone is, you know, overcoming or, you know, um, kind of winning at life with a condition like schizophrenia. So yeah, I think we've got we're still, still a way to go, really. But we'll get there. Thank you. Um... Obviously, you guys have spoken a lot about how important it is to sort of open up channels of communication with them family and to sort of share your experiences and, and work with different sort of medical professionals. Um, but a question from another member is, how do you recognize or establish those boundaries between the kinds of support friends and family can provide and the sorts that you need help of qualified individuals um, to provide? Um, maybe Michael, let me, let me come to you because obviously that must be an, an interesting, you know, boundary for you to understand what you can support and help with and, and what you definitely can't. And, and equally as you've sort of tackled with um, how to discuss mental health and how to help and support Johnny, how have you navigated that? And Johnny, I'd love to hear your answer too. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. There's no, there's no one answer. Um, it, it's a, it's a process. Um, and uh, how 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 do you take it? It's it's it, it, it it's a it's a it's a process of of, of learning and talking, um, reading about people, uh, talking to other people as well, um, and it, it is a process. Uh, it's a slow process. You start talking, uh, and you can start opening up different ways of handling it. My wife handles it by cutting out articles about different things about mental health and putting it in front of Johnny and, 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 and reading it and, and, and talking. She finds that she finds that's a bit easier than, than, than talking, but then talk about it, about it afterwards. Um, I think actually, um, Johnny mentioned, you know, you, you get well-known people. And I, I think, you know, when you, you read about and you hear like Stephen Fry talk so well about, you know, about it and he does so much good, in it um and um you know he's in a good place now um but as he said you know he gets relapses and i i think as i say it's it's asking a question and and don't hide behind the question uh ask a direct question um than trying to go round corners and uh, and and whatever but as i said it's not an easy process it, it just takes it it takes time i know it's it's not probably answer that someone wants but it's 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 not you just can't click your fingers it, it's it just is a slow slow process um and and to sit down and and, and talk about things um uh, you know but as i say you know you 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 learn um as you go along you know it's not not something that you can you know someone teaches you unfortunately but saying that um, you know, there are, again, we, we go back to the situation where there's some websites now and the charities and asking the right question. Um, they can help you. You know, you can learn by, by uh, learning, you know, learning. I think the problem is with people, they just don't know where to turn to uh, for help. That, that's, that's the thing. You can't do everything yourself. You need to have help. 
Um, so, you know, there are organisations that can help. I mean, Johnny mentioned about this young young uh, board that we've got, and they have different issues themselves, um, uh, but they've learned to tackle learn to tackle them. But it takes time. It takes time for them, and it, it also takes time for parents and brothers and sisters and um, uh, and the older generation, which I am. Uh, yeah, you know, we didn't know anything at all about mental health. Now, you know, a lot of famous. I mean, you know, Cambridge is doing some fantastic work. You know, with him talking about mental health, and I think you know, I mean. One somebody said to me about how do you tackle it? Well, you know, if you go to football, you go to to you play golf, you play any sport, whatever. Sportsmen suffer because of the pressures, also when they retire. And so, you know, just mention about someone. Say, did you read about so and so? You know how he's suffering, uh, and it opens up that channel um, by finding uh, then. Uh, yeah, you need to find a channel to, to open it up with. And as I say, well-known people and famous sports people, especially now um, with, uh, with the Duke Cambridge's uh, you know, football. Um, and a lot of footballers are coming out now and, and owning up to, to having issues. Uh, and I think it's, it's a common ground to find someone uh, and you can talk about someone that's well-known to say, did you hear about so-and-so? And it does open up the door. Johnny, anything you'd add? Well, I was just going to say, actually, maybe, you know, after this, we can put some links to, um, like, some of the charity helplines, um, like Minds. Mind have their info line or, or Rethink have their advice line. And, and that's not just for uh, individuals. That's for families as well. And on, you know, so many things. I mean, uh, for example, finances. Um, often that's a, a, a big issue. Um, and... Yeah, things like the benefit system, that's such a difficult one to navigate. And, you know, yeah, care. How do you navigate that, whether you're, whether you're the individual or a family member? But these charities can help, and the charities can provide things like advocacy for people, for individuals, for families. So maybe at the end, actually, we can, yeah, send out some different links to the helplines for people. I think that'd be really useful. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Thank you. Um... I mean, one, one question from a, another member, and I think, you know, this links as well to, I know your experience, but also the story about um, when um, obviously Neil and you were sitting on the bridge um, and how you were going to go grab a coffee. And then obviously someone had called the police and they sort of came to get you. And I, I believe they kind of just, it looked like you basically got arrested, handcuffed and, and kind of thrown in the back of the car. Um, and then as, as your dad said, we're sort of in hospital on your own, um, in your own room. I guess the, the question from the member is, um, I've been into psychiatric units myself and have had traumatic experience that I believe were unnecessary. Do you agree that there needs to be a change in these mental health units? Sometimes I feel like, although I come out better, so to speak, than when they went in, they are far more mentally scarred. So I guess, what, what does reform look like in, in mental health units and, and just the way that we kind of approach suicide mental health recovery um so that's a that's a huge question but no, <laughs> one that's very important for us to dive it is into pretty important and there's a lot of work to do a lot i think a lot of work particularly in inpatient units um i mean yeah i've been in several times to different different units and i mean there's it one one hospital i did come out worse i came out much worse than i was when i went in um it was awful um I, th I think uh, it's it's quite rare to find a, a inpatient psychiatric unit in this in the UK. It's quite rare that that kind of really works for people. Unfortunately, a lot of the time it's just about keeping people safe, you know. Um, but I, I so I went to one um, obviously done a lot of work around the country, and I went to one unit which is in Grimsby. It's 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 called it's called Navigo and. Um, I walked in and I just got a sense straight away that it was different, this, this inpatient unit. So, it, you know, all the inpatient units I've been into, it's, it's very much like them and us, the staff and, and the patient. And it's, there's just, there's a big barrier. But in this unit, they were like, it wasn't like that. They were collaborating. Like 
the patients would work with the staff on you know like creating the menus for the week for the canteen serving the food making the food um the, the whole environment was different there was color on the walls there was positive quotes on the walls there was lots of sunlight that opened up a garden center um or, or that the patients were a lot of them had been gardening and they'd open that up to the public so again there wasn't this this them and us um it was so it was so collaborative and i've never seen that before in a psychiatric hospital that i've been into and um again talking to the patients they just felt really valued and and really heard and listened to and um but it's so rare to find that um i think there's yeah there's there is a huge amount of work to do um when it comes to inpatient i mean there's throughout to be honest throughout the whole mental health system i mean my gosh there's like an unbelievable amount of work to do um you know and i think of things like um you know children's mental health what we call cams and then the transition to the adult mental health service i mean oh my gosh that needs a complete reform to be honest a complete reform we could spend another hour just talking about that um so the entire mental health system needs a reform but particularly inpatient services and i just feel like um yeah it's something that often doesn't get talked about we, you know we are as that we've all, we've all talked about mental health you know it is being addressed more but not the really difficult subjects such as you know inpatient units i just feel like yeah we, we yeah we 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 have, we have got a way to go for sure and again i think i think sorry just we need to look to other countries you know and what they're doing in other so for example in in um south america they have these these uh, psychiatric hospitals and um in the psychiatric hospitals um ex patients come back and they care for uh, new patients that they they're considered like you know the wounded healer um so they come back and it's just a re really interesting model i just think we could be looking to other countries to you know to to learn from them and to yeah to change I know we are running out of time and I'm, I can already tell everybody we'll, we'll run a bit late because there's just so many questions to ask. Um, but I think in terms of reform of the mental health system, um, Johnny, hopefully you will come back and we will do a separate event diving into all of that. Um, but one question from Lily Vetch, and I, I'm going to use it as a, a quick segue into what you're actually working on now. So her question is, she's wondering if you'd gotten a diagnosis earlier in your life and the tools to handle it were supplied to you from the start would you have been able to handle it uh, better as an adult? And I'm going to say the answer to that is a clear yes. And that's why you and your dad have set up beyond. So um, <laughs> maybe I hand over to you, Johnny, to tell us. And then, and then Michael, you know, what is beyond? What are you trying to do? Um, because this is exactly it, right? You're, you're trying to come in um, at a, an early age and, and teach this in schools. But please tell us more about mm. what you're working on and uh, equally how everyone on this call could help support. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, we set up this charity uh, to really focus on what we call early intervention and also the prevention side, you know, because uh, it's just not, again, particularly in, well, all over the world, to be honest, but in the UK, the average time between, you know, your first symptoms of a mental health issue and your diagnosis and your treatment is 10 years. It takes an average of 10 years from, you know, from first symptoms to to diagnosis treatment that's just not good enough um yeah so we set up beyond um as a kind of um mainly as a grant giving organization because um you know we we've been around the country and we've seen so many mental health uh, organizations charities lose their funding i mean that's a whole other thing is is funding and mental health i mean wow um and the cuts to to, to the you know the system it's just but anyway we yeah we saw so many brilliant charities and organizations providing this early intervention going to schools particularly providing early intervention and it's the first thing to always get cut you know when i go to a school and they say oh we had to make some cuts so we got rid of our counseling service it's always the first thing to go and it really frustrates me so yeah we set up beyond um as a grant giving charity to put the money back into particularly those sort of early intervention services um, and yeah particularly into schools and um, you know we're, we're focusing more and more on primary schools uh, which I think is really important you know again um, 
you know, the education side of it, the language side of it, people just aren't given sort of the emotional literacy that they need when they're growing up at all. And yeah, I think if I'd have been given that, I, I, yeah, I'm sh- I, I know that, as you say, things would have been really, really different. But, and again, it, it frustrates me how, you know, um, growing up, young people are taught. So, you know, dad mentioned about dental health. People, young people are taught from a young age the, the importance of looking after their dental health, um, but not their mental health. <laughs> and it just, I don't know, it just doesn't make sense to me why, why, why that happens. Um, so, yeah, so Beyond is very much about uh, uh, the uh, intervention, also the prevention side. So particularly focusing on, on primary schools. Um, again, again, there's a, lot, there's a lot of work to do, but um, I feel like we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Johnny mentioned about early intervention and I mentioned about cancer uh, previously. Um, I was diagnosed very early. Um, thank goodness. Um, so it was early intervention for me, um, which obviously helped. And if there's early intervention for that, then early intervention on mental health helps as well. The earlier, um, the better. We we did um, we did something down in a, a school in in Cornwall um, where we had well-being um, being taught in the for, for children uh, during the day, and then we did something for the parents in the evening. Um, so it followed it followed through as well, and we did something at another school. Johnny's got an older brother. We've got two granddaughters, and did something at that school. And my six-year-old granddaughter now says, "Well, if not everything's right in my head, I, I can talk about it." <laughs> that doesn't mean she talk about mental health, but if, if she doesn't feel, oh, I don't feel happy this, today or whatever. You know, don't you know? So they have a system now of, of doing things as well. So, you know, that's why. And as Johnny quite rightly said, you know, there's a lot of local, very small uh, charities that are doing fantastic work. You know, one, you know, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, when I mentioned about gardening, people with animals helped as well. Um, and there's uh, somewhere in Kent that has a farm. Uh, they're running out of money. So that's what we're trying to trying to do because they're not. You had the big charities who are doing a fantastic job, but also there's a lot of very small charities, and a lot of small charities are actually run by people that have suffered. Um, there's one charity in Newcastle we talk about a lot. Um, a woman runs it. She goes around to school talking about suicide because unfortunately she lost her son. Um, but I think people listen because it's a life story. And also the young board that we have, uh, they've all suffered. One, uh, one of the girls, unfortunately, was in the Manchester bombing. Um, but she talks about how she's overcome things. And she, obviously, so I think what it also does is, it, 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 as Johnny said, you know, we, we talk, uh, Johnny mentioned about Amy Winehouse. We talk also with the Amy Winehouse Foundation um, and they talk about drug and, and, and drink addictions. And there's one speaker that they have that is um, a reformed alcoholic and because they've uh talk about their life story and and this is what you know you can turn your life around um and you know you can go to work you can do i I think it makes a big difference um and so we we're working with small charities as johnny said you know 500 pounds to them makes a big difference I mean, it really does. It's not, you know, these big charities and whatever, but, you know, literally sometimes a small amount can keep them going for a year. Um, and, and that's what we try to do. Um, and also at the same time is to go into schools and then help with parents as well uh, of, of signposting where they can go as well. So it, it's, it's, <laughs> Again, it's not to fit one thing, it's, it's to, to cover lots of different areas. And, it's, and in some areas in the UK, they are real, you know, Cornwall, we've got very little down there. And Norfolk, an area like Norfolk, there's hardly anything there at all. So that, that's what the charity is trying to do, is, is, is uh, raise awareness. Um, we're also not frightened, and John is especially, not frightened to speak out against uh, against it which obviously some of the big charities have to be a little bit more diplomatic uh we're not um 
so again it, it's it's a combination of a obviously us raising funds so we can give out to the, uh to, to charities good grants um and also to help raise awareness as well Amazing. Thank you, Michael. And what we will do is, um, well, I'll, I'll try and wrap up this conversation now, but what we will do is um, we'll follow up with everyone, A, with a list of resources, um, and we will collate Michael and Johnny's brain into a, a great resource list to share. And, and if you are looking to support different charities or looking to get advice and support, um, we'll kind of break those down for you and share some more about beyond. Um, but I just wanted to draw maybe your last remarks, Johnny, in terms of, you know, what you hope people take away with them from this conversation, but also to just weave in another piece, which I believe also you'll have some resources to share as well, which is around um, a question from Lily Vetch in terms of working with people from low income backgrounds and access um, to, um, you know, good mental health services, um, especially if you're trying to go through the NHS system and obviously the failure of that particular system to help with severe mental illnesses. And I know you're very passionate about you know, men's, men's health but also very much men's health in relation to sort of black and asian and ethnic minority communities we've spoken a lot about that before so i'm sure you will follow up with more information but i guess just your thoughts in terms of how you can help support sort of people from from low-income backgrounds who are really suffering from severe mental health well again i think it's the third sector organizations that are picking up the pieces once again um I, again i mentioned particularly mind um, and, and when I say MIND, so MIND obviously is a national charity, but MIND also have local branches all around the country. Um, and particularly actually um, in those areas, uh, which are predominantly kind of BAME. Um, and they do a lot of great work in those areas. Um, so it's worth, it's worth going on to if, you know, particularly, particularly I'd say the MIND website and um, seeing where your local MIND is and what they can offer. Uh, Mind off, often offers very kind of specific niche support, you know, to communities, which is great, which is so needed because yeah, often you can't get that via the, the mental health services in the NHS, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, again, once again, third sector organizations. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry. I've put, what was the first, uh, I guess just your, Oh, your, your yeah. kind of key chat, T, T, key, blah, blah. I can't even get it out, key takeaways or just, you know, what you would like to leave people with this evening or how they can help support beyond. Yeah, I, th I think for me, you know, um, actually, I just want to mention there's a really great campaign from Time to Change and Time to Change is a charity run by Mind and Rethink. It's a, the kind of anti-stigma campaign. And there's a great campaign that they did recently called um, Ask Twice. And it's all about you know, don't be afraid to go back and, and, you know, and ask it again, if you're not sure someone you love might be struggling, don't, yeah, don't be afraid. And it's, again, it's hard. You don't want to, I don't know, feel like you are um, kind of crossing a line or, but if you do it in a really, always in a really gentle, empathetic way. Um, and sometimes it's just even a text, you know, actually something, you know, as dad said, you know, I've got uh, an older brother, dad's got another son. Um, and, you know, we do most of our talking about my mental health via text. And, you know, when I'm struggling, sometimes he'll just send a simple text and it can just, you know, uh, make a huge difference. So, um, yeah, don't underestimate actually the power of, um, well, A, going back and asking again, and, and maybe even again, if you're not sure about someone. Um, but also, you know, just, again, the power of um, simple communication, maybe it's just just that just one text, just a simple text, you know, saying I'm thinking of you, I'm, I'm you know, I'm here, if you want to, if you want to chat, um, it really can make all the difference. Um, often often people say and often young people when we talk to young people they say oh my friend's struggling and i can't get through to them and you know i say you are you are getting through it just it takes time you know you, i say it's all about planting like seeds and and you know it takes time for our walls to are you know we build up these these giant walls um and it takes time for the defenses to come down um so yeah don't 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 underestimate you know, you, you can, you, you, you can get through to people, you will get through to people, but it, it, it can take time. So the two, the two words, I guess, 
I like to use a uh, patience, but persistent persistence as well. Um, you know, don't, don't give up. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today um, and being so candid and, and sharing your thoughts and advice with us. Uh, thank you to all of the members who joined and for your great questions. Um, I think we could have continued going for another hour. So we will make sure that A, we follow up with all of the different bits and pieces that we promised. Um, but B, um, hopefully Johnny will come back again and, and have a broader conversation with us about the mental health care system as well. Um, yeah. So I look forward to that. Um, yeah. But thank you so much for both of you for your time today um, and to everyone who joined us. Um, we will see you very soon and, and have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Take care.